Hi. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the different components of environmental chemistry uh, very quickly. And for that, uh, I'm going to break it down into several different portions. First of all, we're going to start talking about air pollution. And um, the idea is that air pollutant, any air pollutant is any substance that is present in uh, the atmosphere in greater than its natural concentration. All right, that's basically what a pollutant is. Now, uh, that's to say, you know, air is composed of 78% uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and the rest is a mixture of different um, components, including water vapor and carbon dioxide and a little bit of argon. Um, primary air pollutants are those that uh, get emitted directly onto the air, uh, things like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, and uh, secondary pollutants are those that react uh, normally with moisture or with more oxygen and uh, make um, other pollutants. Uh, examples of that are uh, uh, nitric acid, uh, sulfur trioxide, uh, sulfuric acid, etc. All right. Now, I gave you a table that looks something like this. I'm not going to spend much time on that. Uh, talking a little bit about the sources of natural pollutants and uh, whether they are, uh, sorry, sources of primary pollutants, whether they are natural sources or they are man-made sources, and anthropogenic uh, sources. And then basically what the effects are on the health and how could we control uh, those. So. I'm not going to spend any time, uh, especially the one on the lower part uh, is pretty good. It's nice, clean, uh, and direct. You have carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, uh, particulates, and VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Uh, but I do want to spend some time talking about how we can reduce them. All right. The very first one that I want to spend some time uh, with is the idea of using uh, catalytic converters. Catalytic converters are basically um, heterogeneous reactions that are going to be taking place as you um, pass hot gases over uh, palladium, platinum, rhodium, or iridium. Those are normally the ones that we put in the back of our cars uh, or in our cars and the pale in, in, the, in this exhaust system to react. And the two key reactions that we have here, I'm going to highlight. I'm going to try not to speak when I'm away so I know that it, that lowers the volume significantly. Um, I don't know right now why it's not coming. Let me see. Try again. Um, so, the two reactions that I have highlighted there are very important. One of them is to convert carbon monoxide with the pres in the presence of oxygen, and somehow I've lost my arrow. into carbon dioxide. And the second one is more important because uh, nitrogen oxide gets produced in internal combustion um, reactions when there is so much heat that oxygen and nitrogen combine to make NO. And that's a very noxious, very toxic chemical. So we really want to avoid it. It's one of the one, it's a chemical that gives the brown color to um, to smog and to exhaust, all right? And it's very, very um, corrosive. So if we can react that in the presence of rhodium or, pal or platinum, for example, we can get two molecules of carbon, mono uh, carbon monoxide reacting with two molecules of uh, nitrogen monoxide to give us carbon dioxide and nitrogen gas. So we can regenerate uh, diatomic nitrogen, which is very in inoffensive. It's 78% of our atmosphere and uh, we can release uh, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide may not be great because we consider it a pollutant in the sense that it causes greenhouse uh, um, effects, but it's much better for your health than carbon monoxide. As you know, carbon monoxide is toxic. It binds uh, irreversibly to hemoglobin and therefore affects respiration. All right. In addition, catalytic converters can also be uh, used for VOCs, uh, volatile organic compounds. Those are basically the leftover of um, the gas that you have in your cars that does not react properly or it's broken down uh, and not completely um, 
oxidized. So in the presence of a catalyst and enough oxygen, it will continue to react to give you carbon dioxide and water. Again, here we're missing our arrow. Uh, so that's the first type of um, method that we can use for reducing uh, com um, air pollution. Another thing that we can do is we can use thermal exhaust reactors. All right, those are used to um, eliminate or minimize the emission of carbon monoxide and VOCs. Basically, it's continuing to react. It's a second combustion. So you take the exhaust that contains the com not the fully reacted or not the fully oxidized products. Carbon monoxide is not fully oxidized. It would it can still go to carbon dioxide. And uh, the VOCs, which are frac fragments, it could be, they could contain oxygen or not uh, in the CH formula. If you can then react that in the presence of uh, more oxygen, you can get it all the way down to carbon dioxide and water, and that is going to, again, again, be a lot less uh, toxic to the environment than carbon monoxide and the VOCs would be. And again, I'm just going to put the arrows in there. So that happens by actually having a second chamber in the exhaust where the exhaust gases come in. We inject more air and allow this for a second combustion. Now, this does not... Uh, release energy that is useful for the engine, but it does minimize the amount of uh, pollution that is produced. All right? Then the next thing that we can do is do what is called the lean burn engines. Those will reduce the amount of carbon monoxide and, and nitrogen monoxide that is produced. And they basically, it's by aligning the air to fuel ratio, we can um, cause it to go more in one direction or in another direction. So if, it's, if we put a lot of oxygen, we're going to allow for the full conversion of uh, carbon or the fuel into carbon dioxide. So we're going to produce less carbon monoxide. But the problem is that the hotter that the engine becomes, because we're allowing for the reaction to f happen fully, the more nitrogen monoxide that we're going to uh, produced because it's a very endothermic reaction, the production of carbon, uh, sorry, of nitrogen monoxide. We have, we have to break that nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen triple bond. So if we can actually heat it up uh, enough, but uh, to get the carbon to combust to carbon dioxide, but not so much that we don't produce excessive amounts of nitrogen monoxide, that would be great. Uh, lean burn engines use an approximate ratio of 18, uh, a molar ratio of 18 to 1 air and fuel. And that will actually kind of minimize uh, the production of carbon monoxide and uh, nitrogen monoxide. It's not that it really minimizes it, it's just that it's the most ideal ratio, it's the ratio that is less harmful, and then it can be used uh, with the catalytic converters to still get it lower. All right. Uh, another option that we have is the uh, exhaust gas uh, recirculation, and it helps to minimize the amount of uh, nitrogen monoxide because as we recirculate the exhaust back into the engine, we actually reduce the burn temperature. All right. So basically, we're taking some of those exhaust. It's kind of like uh, what we had talked about earlier in the thermal exhaust reactor. Well, this also uses the exhaust. Uh, to come back into the engine, so the VOCs, the carbon, dioxide, carbon monoxide, gets burned again, but that also lowers the temperature, and therefore we produce less nitrogen monoxide. Uh, that those, all of these ideas that we're talking about are very useful for uh, car engines, which, you know, given the fact that we have uh, so many millions of cars uh, out in the streets around the world, it's very important. The next one that I'm going to talk about are more for industrial processes. Uh, one of them is called alkaline uh, scrubbing, and that is to reduce the amount of, car, uh, of sulfur dioxide that is emitted. Sulfur dioxide is um, present in coal and it's present in heavy oil, 
Uh, and it's one of the things that we try to remove when we actually uh, um, refine oil into gasoline. Um, but when we burn that for our power plants, uh, we're going to be uh, releasing it because um, the sulfur is part of the structure of proteins, uh, given that it is present in the cysteine uh, amino acid. In any case, uh, when we burn it, the sulfur gets uh, combined with the oxygen, produces uh, sulfur dioxide, which is a gas and will escape through the chimney stalks. Um, so if we instead produce a, um, some, a, a slurry of limestone and lime, uh, calcium carbonate and calcium oxide that can be sprayed down as the gases uh, go up, what was going to happen is we're going to have a reaction to produce calcium sulfite and calcium sulfate, which will become gypsum. So basically, we're going to be able to produce uh, something that can be sold afterwards um, and re uh, reduces the amount of um, sulfur dioxide that is being um, produced. Again, I'm going to put the arrow so you can see where this goes. So, as the gas moves up the chimney, we spray it with this basic material, both carbon carb uh, calcium carbonate and calcium oxide are bases, and so they will react with the acidic gases to form this uh, calcium salts, calcium sulfite, and the calcium, um, uh, and the calcium uh, the gypsum, basically. Uh, and that's one way of removing uh, SO2, all right? Uh, another way to remove SO2 is what is called the fluidized, ba uh, fluidized bed combustion, all right? So basically, as you're burning the coal, you actually have a limestone powdered in the area, all right? And uh, you're going to burn it on a metal plate. That's what's going to give it the extra heat so it can combust and uh, combine with the oxygen. If you actually have the limestone in place, the limestone will start decomposing to produce calcium oxide and carbon dioxide, but the calcium oxide will react instantaneously with the sulfur dioxide that forms to form calcium sulfide and uh, can also react to make calcium sulfate if you have excess oxygen. So those are the three reactions that you should be able to, uh, to do that. You know that calcium carbonate decomposes. Decompositions are endothermic, so when we have the heat, it's going to break up into the calcium oxide. That calcium oxide can then react further. All right? Uh, finally, one of the things that we don't tend to talk about too much, but it is definitely one of the important, particu uh, important uh, pollutants, are particulates. Particulates, we have them all the time. Uh, some of them are natural, like pollen, uh, but many of them are um, produced, are man-produced, or, or, or from um, anthropogenic sources, especially uh, carbon particles, all right? We tend to produce a lot of this when we burn coal, all right? Uh, but you also see it uh, even from car exhaust. All right, there is definitely this small amounts of carbon particles that form because the combustions are not complete. If this happens, what you can do is uh, you pass the exhaust through uh, charge plates to do what is called electrostatic precipitation. So, uh, electrostatic precipitation is basically taking advantage of the fact that if we pass uh, the polluted air with the particulates uh, through an electric field, the particles, the solid particles, the large solid particles, we say large and, you know, we may not be able to see them, but they're definitely larger than uh, molecules because they're uh, little clusters of carbon atoms, uh, become charged and uh, they keep on traveling once you've passed those through the, the high voltage field that to, in order to charge them. Uh, you pass them afterwards through electric plates and they will attach themselves to the electric plate and therefore be removed from the air solution or the air mixture. Then the purified air can
can exit and um, th those solids can then be washed uh, off or removed. Other ways in which we can actually have uh, precipitation of particulates from the air is what are called settling uh, tanks, uh, cyclone separators, which basically is like a large centrifuge. You can do this with air. If you just just settling uh, tank is instead of allowing, uh, for example, this is when you're producing uh, cement or anything like that. Instead of allowing for um, an exhaust to be present directly to the air, you pass it into a large chamber, and then uh, in the, the air comes, the polluted air comes from one side with all the particles, and you'll have the exit on the other side, and then a stock at the very top. Top. Well, the air has to flow through here, giving it enough time for gravity to act and to remove the larger particles. All right. So um, those are basically the ways that we're going to do uh, air pollution. So.